Thank you. I thought Desire said he's going to sing a song. I Hi. suppose with the time, Elder, maybe you can come in. If we have time, maybe we can sing at the at the end. Okay. 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 Good evening, everyone. Again, it's good to be um, studying together, understanding what was this, what's happening now in this current day and age, and it's very important for us to realize um, the confusion that exists. Generally, my studies are um, predominantly oriented for non-Adventists uh, because I, I'm very much an outreach person than um, an inreach. So inreach people need to understand so that you can outreach and everybody should be, every seven Adventist, let me be more clear, should be able to understand to tell other people. So yesterday, one sister raised a question of the secret rapture. Now, um, secret rapture is not what we believe and understand from the Bible, but millions of Christians out there believe the secret rapture. And therefore, we need to know what it means, how it all came about, and um, how you can uh, explain to them how it started and what's the confusion and where it is coming from and that's what we're going to study in fact um, uh, there is a three-part series on this simply the seven years of tribulation we're looking still at the last week of the 490 year prophecy so a serious study of what happened and what the devil is trying to do with this last week of Bible prophecy, where he placed it in the end of time of a future Antichrist, and that Antichrist never existed all throughout this history since Jesus went to heaven, but he's going to come only at the end, meaning taking away the focus from papacy. That's a snapshot, but we need to know details. Remember, we are doing mathematics. So in a mathematics, you have to do steps and stages and phases of how things came to pass and that is evidence and that is proof that will establish what is truth so before we study today uh, i'll bring up my presentation and then we i'll pray again and then we study so here we are i call this present truth of the mid sorry pre mid and post tribulation and um, it's important to understand how these things came to pass. So let us pray. Heavenly Father, I want to thank you and praise you for the breath of life, counting among the living. Open our ears that we may hear you. Open our eyes that we may see you. May your Holy Spirit direct all our thoughts to understand the confusion that exists today, even as we speak. The confusion is so rampant and actually escalating even today even as we live in this time of October 2023, things are escalating. And uh, in the understanding of this seven years of tribulation and what Israel and everything else would do, therefore, help us to understand. Pray thee that thou would give us guidance. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So here, uh, this three-part series is basically the seven years of tribulation to understand in detail how it came why it came and what it means and what its implications are so simply it's titled the present truth for this time the pre the mid and the post trip so to say what god has raised his people to do today that means seven advantages Medical missionary work. I'm telling you, serious times are coming ahead of us. If you're watching the news and what's happening all around, serious things are coming ahead. And so everybody should take up this medical missionary work and public evangelism. It does not mean that you hold campaigns and start preaching. You don't have to do that. Those who God um, chose to do that, they will do that. But everybody should involve in public evangelism. Either you talk or you share a leaflet booklet, book, whatever, 
but do something to spread the good news that Jesus is coming and there is hope. So every church should be a training school for Christian workers. This is taken from the Ministry of Healing. All this reference just to say its members should be taught how to give Bible readings, how to conduct and teach Sabbath school classes, and it goes on actually to tell more things. So the greatest evangelist effort of all times is about to take place in the near future. This is what Ellen White says. Thousands will come in a day when they see the events being fulfilled as God has revealed. But before that, they have to hear. So somebody has to be telling somebody. Somebody has to be telling somebody. And because ultimately when the loud cry comes, thousands will come. That's Revelation 18, 1 to 5, when the later rain is poured out. Evangelism 43, 4 says, Men of faith and prayer will be constrained to go forth with holy zeal, declaring the words which God gives them. The sins of Babylon will be laid open, and the fearful results of enforcing the observances of the church by civil authority, the inroads of spiritualism, the stealthy but rapid progress of the papal power, all will be unmasked. So by these solemn warnings, the people will be stirred. Thousands upon thousands will listen who have never heard words like this. In amazement, they hear the testimony that Babylon is the church, fallen because of her errors and sins, because of her rejection of the truth sent to her from heaven. It's also found in the book, Great Controversy, by the way. So, are you nervous about conducting a Bible study? I have been for most part of my life. For 40 plus years, born and brought up in the Seventh Adventist Church, third generation, so to say, born and brought up on an Adventist campus and institution, so to say, I was very nervous to talk to people, forget about giving a Bible study. But God's grace, today I give Bible studies to Buddhists, to Hindus, to non-Christians, in fact, go and do uh, seminars for non-Adventist pastors and so forth, all because I simply said, Lord, here am I. I am available, use me. And that's it. And it came from my heart, not from my head. Head is politics, heart is sincerity, and God says he looks the hearts, not the heads. Think about this. Think about this seriously. So he who begins, just want to encourage you, from Christ Objects Lessons to verse 35, he who begins with a little knowledge in a humble way and tells what he knows while speaking diligently for further knowledge, meaning... You teach what you know and seek for further knowledge. While we'll find the whole heavenly treasure awaiting his demand. I'm telling you, this is my experience. Literally, by God's grace. I could not understand books of Daniel and Revelation at all. I started telling something or the other, Daniel 2 and whatever. And by God's grace, today, I, by God's grace, I'm telling you, as his testament, I can stand and go through the book of Daniel and go through the book of Revelation by God's grace and by his grace and mercy, even without having the Bible open and reading. But this happened since 2006 till now. I'm still studying. So the more knowledge he seeks to impart light, the more light he will receive. This is profound and my testimony. The more one tries to explain the word of God to others with love for souls, the plainer it becomes to himself. The more we use our knowledge and experience our powers, the more knowledge and power we shall have. What a blessed promise that we can claim. So we need to invest in our ministry or in your ministry, if I have to say. Get things if you don't have some gadgets that you can go out and teach. Because people need to see. That's why you, we're using PowerPoint. I can simply talk. But a lot of times, it doesn't make that much impact when you use PowerPoints. That is very important for us to understand. Invest in your ministry. Sacrifice. Make something. If you're doing a systematic Bible studies, make something to give them. Now, the, this link after link has to be followed if you're going into systematic Bible study. I'm setting up the stage just to understand. So this is kind of a brief, you want to take a snapshot, you can take a snapshot or the recording is there anyway. So this is kind of a link after link. You have to talk about God's kingdom, salvation, restoration, life and sanctification. That is like the 28 fundamental that are needed to complete so that people can understand. This is for systematic study. So now when you're doing this, remember, this is where we start. 
we start about God's word. The Bible has to be uplifted first. What is the Bible? And Daniel 2, prophecy, amazing. And leading to the second coming, which is the end of the chapter, and talking about signs of second coming and so on and so forth. Then I'm telling you, when this comes, generally people talk about the seven years of tribulation. I'm telling you real time. I face this all the time. So what do you do? That is why we need to study and understand here. So we talk about the secret rapture and the left behind concept. If someone asks you, don't shun it away. And therefore, we need to understand this. And that is why we are studying what we are studying today. So let's begin our study. Pre, mid and post trip. Now this lesson, why should we study this? The lesson's objective is to show the subtle deceptions that are interwoven in the secret rapture doctrine. Remember, we discussed this already, the how and why of Jesus' second coming. So uh, the answer is his return will correspond with his departure. Ecclesiastes 1.9 tells us there's nothing new under the sun. So how is his coming? Will he will be a real event as found in Acts 1 and verse 11? And his coming will be a visible event. Acts 1, 11, Revelation 1 and 7 will be an audible event. Matthew 24, 31 and 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 and will be a personal event. Isaiah 25, 9 and Isaiah 49, 16 and will be an unexpected event. Matthew 24, 44 and 36. Simply explaining some important key points of Jesus' second coming. So why is he coming? To raise the righteous dead. This is Thessalonians 4 and 16. To change the bodies of both the righteous living and the righteous dead and give them both immortality. That's 1 Corinthians 15, 42 to 44 and 50 to 54. And also Philippians 3, 20 to 21. And to take the righteous to heaven. Now both the resurrected and the living. John 14, 2 to 3 and 1 Thessalonians 4, 17. And to destroy the living wicked and put an end to you know, sin, so to say. So 2 Thessalonians 1, 7 to 9, and 2 Thessalonians 2, 8, Jeremiah 25, 33 gives us that understanding. Now Mark Twain, we're just going to understand something here. Mark Twain once said, a lie can travel halfway around the world while truth is putting on its shoe. That's exactly what gossip is. A lie can travel halfway around the world while the truth is still putting on its shoes, meaning the truth has not moved. So the secret rapture doctrine is gone halfway around the world, while the teaching of the second coming of Jesus Christ is still putting on its shoes. Now, let's look at some talking points. We highlight the fact that for every Bible truth, the devil has a counterfeit. You have to remember this all the time in the background. So for the second coming doctrine, the devil came up with this secret rapture doctrine. Let's understand this a little bit more. So the Satan and his demons came up with this and influenced human beings to understand this. Example of what that means. In case of a rapture, this car will be unmanned. A car, if it is there, will be unmanned. Sorry, the picture somehow disappeared. So in a nutshell, what is the secret rapture theory? What is the secret rapture theory? Let's answer the question. According to those teaching this theory, the second, co the coming of Jesus Christ will be in two separate stages. The first will be a secret rapture of the church at the beginning of the supposed seven-year tribulation period, followed by a glorious triumphant return of Christ to the earth, accompanied by the church at the end of the seven-year period. So they say, if left behind, you have seven years to get it right. That is what it means. Because they say, at the end of the seven years, everyone is going to go when Jesus comes the second time, literally. That is basically the essence. But let's understand a little bit about all of this, because Israel is involved in this. And this is escalating today. As we speak today. So they believe that during the seven year period, the Antichrist is going to come into power and God will select 
and sealed 144,000 literal Jews who will take the gospel to the whole world, converting immeasurable souls to Christ. They also believe the great battle of Armageddon is a literal national war against literal Israel, which occurs near the end of the seven years and is brought to a halt by Christ's return with his church. This is what they believe. So then the literal Israel accepts the Lord as the Messiah and enters with him as his covenant people into the 1000 year, meaning the millennium, reign on earth known as the kingdom age. This is what they believe. So 1000 years millennium is going to be reigning on earth, not in heaven. So Christ will do directly over the earth from the throne of David in Jerusalem, where the typical temple services function again. Those who ultimately reject Christ Christ's rule are eventually judged and destroyed at the end of the millennium. So the new believers will then receive immortality and eternity will begin. That's what they believe. That's what they teach. So millions of copies of this movie left behind are sold. Left behind is simply the seven years of pre-tribulation rapture. That's what it talks about. Rapture, the secret rapture. I'm not advocating to watch it. There is a novel entitled Left Behind, which has turned it into a film with the same name. Both the book and the film have been making waves in conservative Christian circles in recent months. And here is a summary of the opening scene of this Christian novel. Look at this. An airplane pilot relaxes in the cockpit as his Boeing 747 flies over the Atlantic toward London's Heathrow Airport. That's the movie, Left Behind. But at the moment, his mind isn't on flying. It's on his Georgia senior flight attendant, for whom he feels a powerful physical attraction. So, look at this. Is the, this is the plot of the movie. So, suddenly he has to see her. Now, leaving the first officer in charge of the plane, he exits the cockpit. But what he finds in the last thing he expected, she grabs him, claws at his arms and presses her face into his chest. She's weeping, terrified, screaming, people are missing, just gone. So the pilot is incredulous, but a few moments of checking persuade him that it is true. People are screaming, leaping from their seats, trying to find their missing friends and loved ones. He knows what has happened. The rapture, the so-called rapture. I'm talking about the description of the movie. And he has been left behind. Remember, in the movie, why was he left behind? Because he, a married man, is lusting after another woman. So considered wicked and left behind. That's the plot in the story, in the movie. So the pilot knows what has happened because his Christian wife has been telling him about the rapture, urging him to get right with God. Now he's terrified, especially when he goes home and finds his wife and son missing too. The movie continues. The pilot calls his wife's church only to find out that the pastor and most of the members have also disappeared. However, a distraught church member who realizes he too has been left behind lends the pilot a videotape that the pastor recorded prior to his departure. In the original movie, the pastor depicted is Pastor T.D. Jakes. I'm telling you <laughs> real time. So, somebody's on unmute, please mute yourself. The pilot plugs the tape into his VCR and watches as the pastor explains what has happened. Then the pastor says, it doesn't make any difference at this point. Why? You're still on earth. The point now is, you have another chance. Don't, don't miss it. Is this fact or fiction? The Bible says it's fiction, not fact. So the secret rapture is a doctrine, is the doctrine of imminency. We're understanding secret rapture. So the generally accepted definition of imminence 
is that secret rapture could come at any moment, meaning there are no signs to occur, no prophecies to be fulfilled before Jesus returns for the rapture of the church. So let's recap. This is secret rapture will happen in a seven year of tribulation will begin. In the first three and a half years, a temple is going to be restored. Animal sacrifice is going to be restored. Temple will rebuild, I mean. And in the middle of the three and a half years, Antichrist comes from Rome, a single man. And then uh, uh, has uh, issues against uh, Israel, but they again reconcile. And then Israel, literal Israel, according to them, preaches to the whole world and the whole world is converted. Sacrifice is stopped. And then... At the end of the three years, Jesus comes, the whole world is converted. That's what they believe and that's what they say will happen. So prior to the coming of Jesus, the world will be divided into four classes of people. According to the Bible, we're going to look at this. What are they? Just before Jesus comes. First one, you'll have the righteous dead. Because they're the ones who will be resurrected in the first resurrection, general resurrection. So you have the first righteous dead. You have the righteous living. The 144,000 symbolic number, I believe it is, that will be alive. Second group, that is. And then you have the third group, which is the wicked dead. And then you have the fourth group, wicked living. When Jesus comes, you have these four groups. This is how it's going to end. You are not going to have, according to the Bible, we're going to look at this and get some evidence from the Bible by God's grace. And that's what we're going to do. So let's examine these four groups. Righteous dead. Job 19, 25 to 27, First Thessalonians 4, 16 talks about it. Job 19, 25. It says, For I know that my Redeemer liveth, and that he shall stand at the later day upon the earth. And though after my skin worms destroy this body, yet in my flesh shall I see God. Job was talking about the resurrection when Jesus comes. It continues, Whom I shall see for myself, and mine eyes shall behold, and not another, though my reins be consumed within me. First Thessalonians 4.16 For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with the shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Talking about the first group of people, the righteous dead. The second group now, the righteous living. First Thessalonians 4.17 Just gives us a snapshot. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds, to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Now the third group, the wicked dead, Revelation 20 and verse 5. But the rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years were finished. So when Jesus comes, if you read the, the Bible, you would see all the wicked who received the source of the first plague and remain till the end and did not die because of the plagues will die when Jesus comes. These are the wicked. And then in the fourth group, the wicked living. They're talking of the wicked living. Second Thessalonians 1 7, 8 and 2 8, and then Jeremiah 25 33. So here it says in Second Thessalonians 1 7, and to you who are troubled, rest with us when the Lord shall be revealed from heaven with the mighty angels. In flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. And it continues in verse 9. And then shall the wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. So when Jesus comes, the brightness will destroy the wicked that are still surviving them. Jeremiah 25, 33 says, The slain of the Lord shall be at that day from end of the earth even unto the other end of the earth. They shall not be lamented, neither gathered, nor buried. They shall be dung upon the ground because there's going to be nobody alive to bury them. So, what are some of the main texts that the proponents of the secret rapture use to support the concept? Let's understand that now. So the talking point or the teaching point or the talking point, the most important thing to remember, emphasize the fact that these texts have been taken out of their context and the importance of keeping things in their proper context. Let's look at these five texts that the proponents of the secret rapture use these texts to 
talk about the secret rapture that it will happen. Matthew 24, 40 to 41. Luke 17, 34 to 37. Daniel 7, 27. First Thessalonians 1, 9 to 10 and 5, 9. And 2 Peter 3 and verse 10. Let's examine them. Matthew 24. Verse 40, then shall two in the field and the one shall be taken and another left. Verse 41, two women shall be grinding at the mill and one shall be taken and the other left. The second text, Luke 17, 34 to 37. I tell you in that night there shall be two men in one bed and one shall be taken and another left. That's a serious text that so many people use for so many different things. But we're only talking in the context of secret rapture at the moment. Two women shall be grinding together. The one shall be taken and the other left. And two men shall be in the field and one shall be taken and the other left. Verse 37. And they answered and said unto him, Where Lord? And he said unto them, Wheresoever the body is, thither will the eagles be gathered together. So the third text they use is Daniel 9 and verse 27. And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. And in the midst of the week, he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. And for the overspreading of the abominations, he shall make it desolate even until the consummation and that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. Remember this text. We're talking about the he in this text. We talked about it a little bit detail yesterday. First Thessalonians 1, 9 to 10. For they shall themselves shew of us what manner of entering in we had unto you and how he turned to God from idols to serve the living and the true God. And to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, which delivered us from the wrath to come. The fifth text they use, First Thessalonians 5, 9. For God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. This is all the foundation of the secret rapture theology that exists outside. So, to conclude this, the sixth text they use, Second Peter 3, 10. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, and in the which the heaven shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat, and the earth also, and the works that are therein shall be burnt up. So if one subscribes to the secret rapture concept, which of the three tribulation theological terminologies does he embrace? Let's look at this. Pre-tribulationism, the Left Behind movie presents pre-tribulationism. That is very important. Let's examine this pre-tribulationism. So, this teaches that the secret rapture occurs before the tribulation starts a seven-year period. And at the time, the church will meet Christ in the air. And then sometime after that, the Antichrist is revealed and the tribulation begins. So, in other words, the secret rapture and the Christ's second coming are separated by at least seven years. So according to this view, the church does not experience any of the tribulation. So the text they use to support this point is 1 Thessalonians 1, 9 to 10 and 5, 9. So the proponents claim that the promise is not preservation through the trial, but deliverance from the hour, that is from the time period of the trial. 1 Thessalonians 1, 9 to 10. Let's recap that again. For they them shall shew us what manner of entering in if we had unto you, and how you turn to God from idols and to serve the living and the true God. And verse 10, and to wait for his son from heaven, whom they raised from the dead, even Jesus, which delivered us from the wrath to come. Very nice text. But the confusion. First Thessalonians 5 9 says, For God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. So the pre tribulationism also maintains the distinction between Israel and the church. And, go, and the God's separate plans for each. That's what they say. So the 77s of Daniel 9.24 are decreed upon Daniel's people, meaning the Jews, and Daniel's holy city, Jerusalem. So this prophecy makes it plain that the 70th week, meaning the tribulation, According to them, we're talking according to them, is a time of purging and restoration for Israel and Jerusalem, not for the church. This is what they believe. So summarizing the pre-tribulationism, we live today in the church age. This is what they propagate. There's going to be a rapture, secret rapture. 
that is the signing of the covenant between Israel and Antichrist when that happens. Then three and a half years of tribulation. Antichrist breaks the covenant now and uh, causes problems for the literal Jews. This is what they teach. And there's going to be another three and a half years where the Jews now convert the whole world and so on and so forth. So now let's look at the mid-tribulationism. So let's examine this and what happens. The mid-tribulation rapture proponents believe that the rapture will occur prior to the great tribulation, which is the last three and a half years of the seven-year tribulation period. So this place is the last three and a half years between the rapture of the church and the second coming of Jesus Christ. This is what this group believes. So now, the proponents believe that the church will go through the little tribulation period of three and a half years, but be removed before the great tribulation starts. So during the last three and a half period, that's what it is. So this would assume that the church would undergo some of God's wrath, but not the worst part of it. This is what they believe. So the mid-tribulation believe simply holds that the rapture will take place in the middle of the seven and a half years tribulation, that the church will be with the Lord for three and a half years and will return to earth with him after the three and a half years have expired. So summarizing them, this is what they believe. The rapture happens after three and a half years of the seven years of tribulation when it begins. So they don't know when that's going to begin and how will they measure the three and a half years. Serious questions to even ask. Let's look at the post-tribulationism. So the post-tribulation teaches that the rapture occurs at the end or near the end of the three and a half year period of the great tribulation, meaning towards the end of the seventh year. So at that time, the church will meet Christ in the air and then return to earth for the commencements of Christ's kingdom. So they're going to go and come back immediately. That's what they believe. So in other words, the rapture and Christ's second coming to set up his kingdom happen almost simultaneously. According to this view, the church goes through the entire seven years of tribulation, the little tribulation and the great tribulation. Three and a half years of little tribulation, three and a half years of great tribulation. This is what they believe. This is how they are confused. Even in the seven year tribulation and secret rapture doctrine, there is confusion. This is what the devil is doing. So majority believe in the pre-tribulation. Some believe in the mid-tribulation and few believe in the post-tribulation. That is the order. So what about this seven years tribulation time period in itself? Let's look at the Daniel 9.27 is what is causing the confusion that the devil brought into Christianity. Let's examine this. And he said upon... And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. And in the midst of the week, he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. And for the overspreading of the oblation, he shall make it desolate, even until the consummation. And that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. So he in Daniel 9.27, they say is the Antichrist. That's what they say. So... The week will, according to its proponents, constitute the seven-year tribulation period prior to which the secret rapture will occur. They got the seven-year tribulation by lifting the 70th week of Daniel's prophecy of Daniel 9, 24 to 27, completely out of its context and shoving it far into the future where it is logically no longer the 70th week. They claim it will be fulfilled after Christ comes to snatch away the righteous secretly, meaning secret rapture. So they agree that the 69 weeks of Daniel 9.25, look at this, this is very interesting. They agree that the 69 weeks of Daniel 9.25 refer to the period before Christ's first advent, but then insert a 2,000 year gap theory. Before the 70th week is fulfilled, they allow 69 weeks plus 2,000 years plus one week for a total of approximately 2,490 years. That's the prophecy. That's what they teach. So the rapture is believed. They have extended the Jewish provision. And based upon this, they teach that all the Jews will be saved in the great second chance after the secret rapture takes place. So first, there is no biblical evidence for a seven-year period of tribulation following Jesus' return to earth. There is no seven-year period of 
reconsider our lives and change our destiny. The Bible is very clear. When Jesus returns, every person's eternal fate has been decided and individuals who have lost will not have a second chance to be saved. Daniel 9 is about Jesus Christ, our Messiah. Nobody else. No Antichrist. We need to understand this very clearly. So remember, we studied so far. We began our study actually one week. We did a few months ago. We began at 457 BC. We understood how 457 BC. We have come to AD 27. We have come to even in AD 31. Now we are trying to look at the last seven years from 27 AD. What does it mean? So AD 31 and AD 34. We will conclude with AD 34 in our last study. And then 1844, October 22. So remember when AD 34... Sorry, when AD 31, what happened when Jesus was on the cross? The lamb escaped. And uh, the temple was in disarray. So let's look at the devil's counterfeit. This is how it is. The pre-tribulation rapture talks that the tribulation happens before the seven-year period. Mid-tribulation rapture in the middle of the three and a half years. And post-tribulation rapture at the end of the seven years. Three groups even in the secret rapture doctrine, the devil's counterfeit. So now they realize when actually Jesus comes, remember when actually Jesus comes, they now realize they have been left. They have not left Babylon. They will come hearing the loud cry before Jesus comes. When Revelation 13, 15, 16 and 17 come to pass according to Revelation 14, 9 to 11. When the time period comes. So what does the Bible say about God's people and tribulation? John 16, 33 and Matthew 24, 21 and 22. So remember the talking point is this. Focus on the fact that God gives his people strength to go through trials and tribulation. And does not necessarily deliver them from trials and tribulation. In fact, I want to say if a faithful believer is not having trials and tribulation, meaning he is not faithful. If a believer is not having trials and tribulations, he is not faithful. If a believer is having trials and tribulations, that means he is doing something right according to God's grace, according to his direction. And the devil is not happy, so he brings infliction. First John 16.33 It says, These things I have spoken unto you that ye may might have peace. In the world ye shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. So Jesus himself is saying, In the world, there is going to be tribulation. Matthew 24, 21 and 22 talks about the tribulation that will happen towards the end. And it says, For then shall be great tribulation such as were not since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor ever shall be. Except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved, but for the elect's sake, that those days should be shortened. I want to pause here and briefly say what, I was, what the Spirit brought to my mind. In the dark ages, in the times of inquisition, in the times of um, persecution and killing in the past, 538 AD to 1798 AD, they did not have technology. They did not have motor vehicles. They did not even have bicycles. They either had to go on foot or horseback or donkey back, camel back, whatever animal back. Find people. Examine them, uh, ask question them and whatever to understand what they believe and what they stand for before they could actually kill anybody or persecute anybody. Today, you have all the database. You can be sitting somewhere in the middle of uh, some forest or woodland or desert or whatever it be, cave. They have the technology to identify them, that there are some human beings in that place and in no time drones can come or whatever can come and identify who you are and persecute and kill. That's why Jesus said in Matthew 24, 22, it will be shortened for the elect's sake. I believe it's going to be a very, very short time period. Are we preparing for such a time? So one must question, if the elect of God's people are raptured before the great tribulation, why would they need the day shortened? Actually, all throughout the Bible, we are given examples 
of God's people being sustained in the middle of tribulations, not being saved before it or being delivered from it. Serious points to consider. So let's look at some examples. The Israelites in Egypt, Exodus chapter 12. When the Israelites were captives in Egypt, God preserved them in the midst of the plagues that devastated Egypt. Just as Israel was delivered from Egyptian bondage after the plagues, so God's church will be protected through the plagues and be delivered from the hand of the oppressor. With 1 Corinthians 10, 11, Psalms 91, 46. We're not reading all those verses, just highlighting the examples. You can read them for yourself. The three Hebrew boys, the second example, in Daniel chapter 3. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, those are the Babylonian names given to them, entered the flames when they refused to yield to the universal death decree of Babylon's king. Their death-defying faith forced them to face the flames of tribulation. And in those flames, God miraculously delivered them. Daniel chapter 3. Third example, Daniel praying to his God, according to Daniel chapter 6. Daniel's decision to be faithful to his daily prayers caused him to be tossed into the lion's den. God saved Daniel while he was going through tribulation. Not before it came. Daniel chapter 6. So this seven-year tribulation is not scriptural. It is not scriptural. Similarly, right before Christ returns, the faithfulness of the elect will cause them to be the target of the ungodly, bringing about a time of persecution and great tribulation. However, just as throughout all of biblical history, God preserves his elect. The same Jesus that was with the Hebrew men in the fire and the lion's den will go with us through our trials. When the last day judgments are poured out upon this world, meaning the seven last plagues, God will shield those who follow him with all their heart and mind. So the devil has been sharpening his skills of deception for 6,000 years and his last masquerade will be his masterpiece. Jesus wants that he will do such a convincing job that if it were possible, even the very elect would be deceived. Satan has introduced the strong delusion of a secret rapture to the Christian world that has been almost universally accepted by mainstream churches today. So as we have noticed, the Bible clearly teaches that Jesus Christ will come the second time in a glorious majesty to take his redeemed home with him. It will be a personal, it will be a visible, it will be an earth-shaking event that everyone alive will know about. The righteous will be caught up to meet the Lord in the air, as found in 1st 17, whereas the wicked will be slain by the brightness of his coming, as 2nd Thessalonians 2 8. And let us carefully, diligently study our Bibles so we will not be deceived concerning his most important and wonderful hope, the second coming of Jesus Christ. And it's a good question to ask when you study with somebody. I understand and believe what the Bible teaches about today's subject, and it is my desire to follow what it says it's good to do that to take a commitment and the information presented was not clear and i need more information you can ask that question too and then provide it to them by god's grace so need to pray seriously i'm telling you everyone needs to pray seriously and be his witnesses trying to reach out to the countless people out there who do not understand jesus is waiting on seven adventists and one day soon, he's going to decide enough is enough and come. The question will simply be, is will you be there or are you ready to meet Jesus? May God be with us and God bless as we live lives on this earth. Amen. Amen. Wow. <laughs> Thank you so much, uh, Brother Robert, for taking us through for um, this study. For those who have joined a little bit late, who are not able to be with us during the week um, so far, or who just joined us a little bit later, we have been going through the 2300 year prophecy and the first part being the 490 year prophecy 
Brother Robert dealt with the start of that prophecy being four, five, seven, a few weeks before. But now he was going through the 483 years, the 483 years that took us to AD 27, Christ's baptism. Thereafter, he's been taking us through the seven year um, part of the prophecy of the 490 years and debunking the conflicting doctrine that is out there in our fellow uh, Protestant Christian churches so that we are not deceived. And he's encouraged us to study our Bibles so that we're fully aware of what is to come, lest we ourselves are confused by the greatest event that is yet to come when Christ returns. And so we have been learning, for those maybe who have heard or have not heard about it, the seven-year prophecy of the 490-year prophecy, which is part of the 2,300-year prophecy in Daniel 8 and verse 14. And what Brother Robert has dealt with tonight and started yesterday was the confusion that is out there the pre-tribulation, mid-tribulation, and post-tribulation doctrine of the futurists that not only all... that, the kinds of things that they are being taken away from the Christ that is supposed to come in the near future. So we are admonished to be aware, to study for ourselves, and study thoroughly as the Holy Spirit leads us. I hope that you have learned much, reconfirmed what you knew before, but also we are encouraged to learn these things so that we can give the Bible studies. And it's by God's grace that even that time of tribulation that the church will go through will be shortened for the very elect. Brother Robert, thank you very much. God bless you for the time you spent teaching us. And we hope that our brethren will be back here tomorrow to hear more. Somebody is unmuted. Would you mute, please? Brother Desire, I believe you had a special writing for us. Are you available to share the special item, Brother Desire? You're muted if you're speaking. All right, Brother Desire might otherwise be engaged. So brethren, I'm going to ask uh, Brother Robert if he'll close us in prayer and then we'll make the final announcement. God bless you. And please take us into the close of our session, Brother Robert. Let us pray. Father in heaven, seated in the most holy place, we come to your throne of grace and mercy, seeking your favor. Thank you, Lord, for revealing to us what the devil is doing and what you said will happen. Open our eyes, O Lord, that we would continue to see and discern so that we could be prepared and not be deceived and also be able to reach out to others and show them so that they can come out of deception which they already are in. Oh Lord, may your Holy Spirit guide each one and help us and guide us in all things so that we would always want to follow you and you would lead us and guide us, mold us and fashion us so that in all our words, thoughts and actions, we can represent you, be a witness, be a people who are prepared for your coming. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, man. Thank you. Thank you, brother. you all for sorry we'll... to be with you and we meet again. Thank you, brother Rob. We hope to see you tomorrow. Um, greetings to your family and may God be with you, brethren. We are meeting again tomorrow at 4 45 a.m. for the morning prayers at 5 30 for the study of desire of ages. Um, a.m. and we continue midday prayers at 12. For those who are able to join a midday prayer session, please do so. Um, and then we come back again at 6.30 for some service if you're available. 
to start our evening devotion at seven o'clock. We are encouraging you please to be prompt, otherwise you will miss much, but please be prompt so that we can start on time. May God bless you, sleep well, and we will see you tomorrow by God's grace. Good night.